okay? So now let's call up Elizabeth and Hikmet, and what we're going to do is talk through two case studies of shared value. Uh, and as they're coming up, Elizabeth is uh, the CEO and president of OPIC, Overseas Private Investment Corporation. She's an investor, uh, provides debt, uh, uh, capital, and some insurance to U.S.-based companies who are operating in difficult and challenging and developing uh, and not advanced countries. Uh, and OPIC uh, is uh, an entity of the government. So it's an investor, but it's a government entity. Uh, and has a, a, a sub substantial capital uh, placed in companies around the world. And we'll talk about, uh, Elizabeth, we'll ask Elizabeth to talk about her business and, and how OPIC works and, and, and this notion of how does this relate to shared value. And then, of course, Hikmet is CEO of Western Union. Uh, this is a, West, uh, a Fortune 500 you know, for-profit company uh, with operations truly globally, again, with a lot of significant revenues in the developing and challenging parts of the world. Um, and it's in the business of tr uh, transferring funds across the globe. Uh, uh, and to pretty much every nook and cranny of the world, whether there's a banking sector or whether there's a, even a town, uh, Western Union is everywhere. Uh, and it's a critical uh, player in the world of the transfer of remittances and uh, 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 aid payments and, and other uh, financial flows uh, across the world. So these are very different organizations doing very different things, but what we'd like to understand is you know, how do they, what's their strategy? And kind of where does shared value fit? And then I think we'll dive into some of the interesting issues and complexities that come from that. So Elizabeth, would you start us off? Tell us about OPEC, tell us about the strategy, tell us about, uh, you know, how you're trying to add value in your business. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Michael. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here with all of you uh, today. You know, in, in many senses, you, your, your talk earlier got me thinking a lot, and I think I'm, I'm going to say completely different things than I was expecting to say, so I apologize <laughs> if I it's okay. run off the script. But, you know, in many senses, um, OPIC is the public sector catalyst in the U.S. for shared value investing in emerging markets. You know, because our very mandate is to help ignite and stimulate private capital flows uh, into sustainable economic investments in emerging markets. So. And we invest in the kind of things like, you know, critical infrastructure, like water, sanitation, health, education, power is very important to us, but also microfinance and, and SMEs and, and many of the things, Hikmet, that I know you're going you're gonna to talk to us about. So um, in a way, we are, we're, we're, we're the embodiment of a, share, of a public sector shared value in, investor. Um, and we do that by providing uh, financing, which is about 80% 80, 80 of our business, uh, long-term loans and guarantees. Uh, both to directly to companies, but also to private equity funds, um, as well as political risk insurance and other kinds of risk mitigants that remove the barriers to those investments and that capital flowing into markets that otherwise would be too risky or too difficult for investors to, to invest in. So right now we're about an $18 billion portfolio spread over 106 countries uh, throughout the world. And our clients range from NGOs to small businesses to large companies investing in you know, the power sector. Um, and I mentioned that we're sort of an, an embodiment of a, of a sustainable uh, shared value investor because we are sustainable. We generate um, income every year that goes right back to the taxpayer, um, anywhere between 350 and about $450 million a year uh, we generate because our loans are priced uh, to risk. So we, we have a commercial basis of operating. But what you were saying earlier, uh, Michael, that made me that made me sort of twig on on something I, I hadn't expected to mention, and that is that we wouldn't exist, OPIC wouldn't exist today, if Richard Nixon didn't have a strategy, because we were carved out of USAID about 40 years ago, 40 plus years ago, because Richard Nixon at the time saw that the private sector was going to become a major vector for creating value and good in the world. And that unless the U.S. government provided that private sector with investment banking services, 
to make sure that the, that capital flowed and those, those investors, potential investors in emerging markets had the support they needed to make those investments, this, this opportunity wasn't going to be taken. And in fact, it's, it was a very prescient decision and a prescient strategy because at the time, the vast majority of the money, the capital flowing into developing countries was aid. It was grant money, overseas development assistance. And in the inter intervening 40 years, that's completely flipped around. And now for every dollar in aid that flows in, $7 in foreign direct investment, that which we catalyze, is flowing into these markets. And in the intervening years, every other G7 country has created, pretty much, has created an OPEC to help catalyze those flows. And that FDI model of doing development is actually growing at 10 times the rate today, and has been for the last decade, that the traditional ODA model has been growing. So that was, that was a strategy, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's a very important one, and, and, uh, and one that I think we, we would love to explore and discuss. And in fact, now we got to rethink, what's the strategy for the next 20 years in the <laughs> US government in terms of harnessing private capital flows and channeling them in the service of making the world a better place? Um, Again, infrastructure, power, water, health, sanitation. Because now we have a new competitor on the horizon that causes us to need to rethink the way we operate in the world. You've heard about the creation of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, the actions of other DFIs in other countries, the BRIC Bank that's been created. What's going to be the US government's response to those, those important geopolitical uh, initiatives? So anyway, I have a few ideas about that, but um, I would just share that in terms of who we are, what we do, and how we were created by uh, a President of the United States having a strategy about what the world was going to look like 40 years hence. Right. Well, let me ask a few follow-up questions just to yeah. clarify for the audience. So first of all, are you a charity? Is OPEC a charity? We're a US government agency that's independent and, in, and is financially sustainable. So and no, we're not a charity. So you actually make a profit? We make a profit. The profit goes back to the Treasury and actually cross-subsidizes other parts of the foreign okay. policy agenda. Okay, so did you hear that? This organization makes substantial profits that goes back and subsidizes the rest of the government. Okay, this is not a charity. This is a, 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 for -pro basically a profitable entity that delivers enough value uh, that it actually is able to generate capital for the U.S. government. So and it's, if it's, you it's, ever bump into your congressmen or your senators, it would be great if you could just understand that point. Just mention that. that. Yeah, I mean, this is, <coughs> see, this is how government can think totally differently about delivering its services and its value. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and Elizabeth, I think, has you know, done a marvelous job in, in moving the organization in this direction. What's OPEC's advantage over all the other sources of capital out there that are placing capital in, in developing countries? Um, Today, and I understand it today, might, be, might well, be changing in the future. One context is, uh, as a government agency, we have more constraints on us than, than one might in the, in, the, in, the, in the full free market. Mm -hmm. And actually, OPEC is, frankly, a lot smaller than our European competitors. Mm -hmm. We're more resource constrained than they are, and we have less tools and instruments than they do. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that I did when I arrived was to look at what are our constraints and what, what is that creating in terms of competitive disadvantage? Mm -hmm. And then what are we going to do to address that? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we've done, because we are smaller, much smaller, frankly, the, are the Dutch equivalent of OPIC is about almost twice our size in terms mm -hmm. of staff. Just think about that. It's a smaller economy. Um, so we thought about, OK, within those constraints, what are we going to do? First of all, the, one of the things is to try to work as hard as we can to create efficiencies so that we're driving you know, both costs down, but also rationalizing pricing at the same time. So enormous amount of efforts to you know, shift from paper to web-based systems to do a lot more in terms of efficiency. Another efficiency was to try to outsource origination, working with partners that have a global presence that can generate business and refer it our way. Partners ranging from the embassies all throughout the world and making sure that those embassies know exactly what kind of opportunity is the right kind of opportunity for for OPEC where we can add value. Working with Citibank and other investment banks that have a presence in these markets who can originate transactions, share risk with us, mm -hmm. but enable us to see and do business that we wouldn't otherwise mm -hmm. see. Um, so those are some of, the, some of the methodologies. Now, how do we, 
what values do we need to instill in the agency to, in order to make those partnerships work and those methodologies for working more efficiently while working very closely with the other development finance institutions. And sorry, as, as another one I should have added because we have a cons distinct comparative advantage with them. So for example, with IFC, a sister agency, or Citibank, what do we bring to the table? We bring the ability to do much longer term financing than they can do, to take risks that they can't take. Um, what do they bring to the table? A, ne a network on the ground that we don't have, the ability, the ability to invest equity, which we can't do, and in some cases, the ability to make grants, which we can't do. Mm -hmm. So we looked at our comparative advantage between these partner agencies and ours and saw, huh, there's a good fit here. Mm -hmm. But underneath that, to make those collaborations and those partnerships work and the efficiencies within the agency work, we need to instill values like uh, making employees feel that this is the best place they could possibly work in government and therefore they're willing to invest in those efficiencies. Mm -hmm. And in p terms of making those partnerships work, being frankly c pathologically collaborative and really in <laughs> making sure that we're bending over backwards to try to you know, be a, a client service partner oriented uh, organization to work. Because when you're small and you're constrained and you don't have all the tools that others have, you're kind of the one that needs to make the extra effort. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we've tried to do that. That's right. How do you measure how well you're doing at shared value? Um, we're our, well, all of our projects are monitored on a regular basis. Um, we do about 100 a year, and we choose our customers by those that are, we believe, going to uphold the highest standards. You mentioned risk and, and operational controls. Not only up, uphold the highest standards of environmental labor and social uh, policies, but also report on those in terms of development impact. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we choose our customers carefully, very carefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of, the, one of the really key principles of strategy is you choose your customers. You don't, the customers that you have isn't a default. And, and, and so I think we want, let's accent Elizabeth's comment here, very, very powerful concept. So a government entity can have a strategy based on shared value and adding value in the discovery and providing of capital to kind of bolster that shared value and actually generate you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of profit, quote unquote, uh, that subsidizes all of the other stuff that's going on in the government that isn't making, <laughs> uh, it isn't, isn't thought about that way. You know, kind of a fascinating example really on the investor or the capital provider side. So let's turn to Hikmet. Uh, Hikmet, you're a, a you know, for-profit company, you've got shareholders, uh, you're global. Talk, talk about the Western Union strategy and kind of how does shared value fit in that strategy and how is, how is that unfolded you know, under your leadership and the leadership of your predecessors? Well, first of all, let me thank you for having me here. And Justin, yeah, thank you also. And yes, we are in Mali and maybe you used our service. We have about 1,000 locations in Mali. <laughs> and we are, as a Western Union, <clears throat> in 200 countries and territories. We have about 500,000 locations, 100,000 ATMs millions of accounts, millions of iPhones, apps, which you can transfer money cross-border. And we do choose our customers. We do choose our customers on the send side. We do choose our customers on the receive side. We specialize on the send side on migrants, which are probably not seen as the most, for many companies, as not seen as the most valuable higher-end customers. We call them heroes because they do leave their countries, they sacrifice, they leave their families back home and go to another country and uh, send money back home. Uh, working in a hospital in New York maybe as a nurse, leaving Philippines with their children and send $300 back home. And this $300 sends a child for a year to school in Philippines and changes the children's life. And we charge money for that. And we are a high profitable company. We do 20% margin, about 30% margins. Our shareholders are, I believe, satisfied currently. As every CEO, I do look at also on my iPhone and look how my share is doing daily, maybe <laughs> four or five times. And if a CEO says that they do, don't do that, they lie. Uh, so we do have shareholder pressure, obviously. But uh, we are proud to serving a customer segment which changes the world. And we are proud to serving a customer which trusts us. 
And the customer trusts us is, you know, it's not, they make about $1,000 or $2,000 max a month. It's our average uh, customer make less than $1,000 a month. And half of the money is sent twice a uh, month back home. Our average transaction is about $200. So while we do that, <coughs> we have to, we say that we have to understand the customer needs. We do ethnic marketing. We specialize on ethnic market. I call us probably best ethnic marketing company of the world. We, too pay, uh, we speak to an Albanian in UK differently than in Germany. We do speak to a, a Filipino differently in Canada than in, in Finland. And we go, uh, you know, we understand their needs. We make marketing. We do Mother's Day. It was grad, uh, just Mother's Day, as you know, last week. We do Mother's Day promotions. We invest there because we know that we're going to get back, we're going to make profit. At the Mother's Day, we touch the people's um, feelings, we touch the people's way of doing transactions. Most of the time what happens is that you do Skype with your mom or you text with your mom if you live in a different country. While you Skype with your mom, you text with your mom, we do, uh, we do promotions saying that do you want to send $100 to your mom as a gift and via Western Union. And that promotion changes mom's life in India, in Bihar, in the rural areas, which your mom can go to hospital or to a doctor visit. So it is the, <coughs> we, you know, IKEA example, you brought it, that's a perfect example. We as Western Union did specialize on one segment, on the migrants and their loved ones on the back home. And uh, on, the second thing what we specialize also are on the SMEs who try to make cross-border money uh, transfers. Um, exporter, importers, there are many, many small importers, exporters in developing countries, especially the exporters. Uh, when you send your good from Malaysia to UK, it's hard to, uh, in the, when you are you know, a furniture builder in the rural area of Malaysia, it's hard to receive your $40,000 immediately from the UK. Uh, but this guy in Malaysia needs the money immediately because he has to pay, he needs a cash flow, he has to pay his employees, he has to produce, he has to create jobs. So it's a creation of jobs in Malaysia. And the exporter in UK wants to pay this guy immediately because he wants to build that value chain that he gets every time the goods. And we went uh, that direction and we invested on SME money transfer, cross-border money transfer. It's a, our growing part of our business. And uh, within that environment, recently, we launched a new product called NGO Pay. We interviewed actually NGOs, many of them here are here, said, what's your needs are? And they told us, you know, I have a problem. I have these funds, it's not the money but it's the distribution of the money to the <laughs> last parts of uh, Mali's or last part of the part that the teacher or the nurse or the doctor directly gets the money, monthly salary, that continues to teach children. And so what we have done is that we went to the NGO, say that uh, you know, there's an NGO pay, you, we will take the money, let's say $100,000, and divide it by the teachers you want to distribute it and directly send the money so they can get their sellers immediately and they can continue to teach the children at school in the rural areas. And another product we recently uh, launched is the university pays. One of the most difficult thing is that US, for instance, and UK attracts students from Asia, uh, students from uh, South Asia, from China. And you get that, you know, they're smart guys. They really know how to run the numbers. They have good statistics. I have some of them in my company. But the issue is that if you uh, are accepted by Oxford or by, uh, by Yale, Harvard, University, Harvard <laughs> of course, Harvard, <laughs> the issue is that if you accept it, you get the invitation letter from Harvard, from Professor Porter. But the issue is that if you want to get there, you can't get there because you don't get a visa. You get only a visa if you pay your uh, first installment, first tuition payment. And uh, so what we said that, okay, we went to Harvard, we do it basically with Harvard, and the Indian student pays in rupees, 
we sent the money to Harvard, and Harvard doesn't want to do anything with it. They just want to teach. They don't want to deal with, uh, with payments. They just want to know that the money has arrived. They can send a message to the US Embassy in India that the students can go and study. So it's again a sh creating a shared value. We as West Union have that kind of uh, in our DNA. It's a very mission-driven brand. It's all the 165 years old company. We innovate us constantly. Shared value, you asked so how we went to the shared value. Well, shared value happened as uh, in def was default in the past. Um, I, I'm now 16 years with the company, 15 years at the company. I was running the international part before I became a CEO. I was build it, they will come. It was the globalization. People were moving. Money movement was easy. So I opened countries. Another 100 million there, another 500 million there, another 300 million there. I opened countries, negotiated with the central banks a deal, and then we opened new agents in the countries. But then business happened to us, and we were growing like 20, 30 percent. And if business happens to us, or to you, one of the biggest mistakes what uh, CEOs do is that they lean back, they forget about the future strategy. It blinds you. The profits blinds you about the future strategy. So we said that, I said, and as I became CEO, okay, it was 2009, 2010, after the crisis. So it was all about transformation. They asked me, the board asked me to transform the company. And I said, one of the most important thing is the shared value. We have to design it. It should not happen as with default. We included in our strategy how we create shared value and we created a shared value committee and say that, OK, we have to invite customers there. So we asked just the customers, because sitting in a corner of us, like my office in Denver, Colorado, looking at the Rocky Mountains, doesn't work. You have to understand. You have to get customers. So we invited customers worldwide. We had customer sessions. They told us what their needs are. And one of them were the universities. One of them were the NGOs. One of them were the consumers. So was that uh, shared for value happened now by design since five years we follow the strategy. Mm -hmm. And just one quick question. What is the unique competitive advantage of Western Union as of today? I think the unique competitive advantage is the complexity of the business. It's not easy moving um, money cross border. So our uniqueness is we say that we are not focusing on domestic money payments. We are the competitive advantage. Our competitive advantage is the cross-border money transfer, mm -hmm. cross-border cross-currency. Once you move money from New York to Los Angeles, it's easy. But if you move money from New York to Mali, it gets complicated. And we said that's our biggest competitive advantage. And believe me or not, the changing regulatory environment over time, the last four or five years, especially the financial services after the crisis, actually helped us. And we like us, we invest there. In the beginning, I never forget, my general counsel was walking every 10 minutes to my office. Hey, Hikmet, we should do that. Hey, Hikmet, this is changing. And you know, if a general counsel walks in your office every 10 minutes, you get nervous, right? <laughs> so uh, I said, no, well, John, listen. This is OK. Let's invest here. We went to the board. And I went to the board and to the shareholders saying that, OK, I'm going to invest with about 4% of my revenue in the anti-money lender compliance and regulatory environment. And of course, the investors didn't like it in the beginning, the short term especially. If you look at our, um, we surprised them. If you look at their uh, our chart the last five, six years on your iPhones, you will see there's a some dips there. And the first reaction of the investor is that, hold on a second, what are you doing? Your quarterly results, what are you doing here? We told them, this is competitive advantage, this is uniqueness of West Union. We're going to invest here because we believe that this the only company can move money cross border, 16,000 corridors, 30, trans 29 transactions every second. Only, it's only us. We're going to invest here. It will be long-term competitive advantage. And it started to be a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, many uh, they, the companies or banks didn't invest in that. They're getting out of it. And it's also a barrier for entrance for many companies in that environment. Mm -hmm. I, got, I had many interviews, and uh, you know it, is that um, you know, the social media will take away your business. 
or the, all the uh, newcomers will take away your business. But we in early stages say that, okay, if we invest there, if we are unique there, if we keep that and we will be um, as from a disadvantage in the beginning, making an advantage, competitive advantage, is the uniqueness of West Union. And the second thing is that don't forget that the trust we build over the years, our brand awareness in Africa is 99%. In South Asia is about 98%. And if you ask in that room, West Union, ma many people will say in this room, well, West Union is still uh, sending telegraphs probably. You know, remember? We are not. <laughs> okay? But if you go and ask a customer in the rural areas where Jamaican community is here in New York, or where uh, a Chinese community, everybody will know West Union. Mm -hmm. So the trust we build over the years is a huge competitive advantage. Yeah. And th th the last point maybe I want to make is that um, it's hard while improving, correcting your core business and investing in the future opportunities at the same mm -hmm. time if you're a publicly traded company. Mm -hmm. You have to tell your vision, and I learned that it. it's not happening like that. I learned in my CEO career and made many mistakes also. It takes time to uh, tell the story to your share shareholders. It has to be convincing and you have to execute about the story also. It's mm -hmm. not like, you know, one thing investors hate is that the word, trust me. <laughs> it will come. You have to prove that you your money you invest in a company gives back, and that's what we have been proving, especially the last few quarters. Mm -hmm. And the reaction on the stock is, you know, mm -hmm. shows itself. Yeah. So the core advantage is you're trusted to be honest, to be compliant, to to to, to, to sort of stamp out the illegal movement of money around the we world. We hate bad money. To we be love fair good money. to the community and to really sort of do everything you can to make these products and services really enable people to improve their lives that are in the situation of needing to move money around the world. So, and, and again, what are all those things I just mentioned? They're, they're shared value. No, um, absolutely. No, absolutely. I mean, you know, if you, end of the day, the people are smarter than you think. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the customers especially are smarter, the clients. And developing the strategy, sitting in an office that you think you are smarter than the customer, um, doesn't happen. You know, there is a, everybody listens to the voice of the customer. That's normal. Everybody should do that, every business leader. But predicting the next step of the customer, what mm -hmm. will that be, it's the hardest part. Mm -hmm. To do so, you have to live like a customer. One thing we do is that every of my meetings starts with the conference call of a customer, voice of the customers. We dial in all high paid executives. They make millions, right? Hopefully when the stock goes up and we make profit. We dial in, sit and 15 minutes, every meeting, every morning starts with a customer from Vietnam or customer from Peru or customer from Sweden. And we listen to that. And somebody takes notes and we follow up with that. If a meeting starts without, I left meetings. If the meeting starts without the voice of the customer, I leave the meeting in the beginning. And with that, the discipline of listening and predicting the customer needs mm -hmm. has been um, extremely uh, valuable for West Union. The head of Africa who built for me Africa for 10 years was reporting to me. I asked him three years ago to build our digital business. You know, the digital competition is coming. There are many small competitor, competitors attacking West Union, high profitable business. And I asked him to build, to go to Bay Area, to San Francisco, and build me the digital business. Everyone, including the shareholders, asked, why do you ask somebody from Africa to go to, you know, Bay Area? If there are so many smart people in the Bay Area, they know that it better, you know, the digital, why don't you hire someone? I said, no, this guy understands the needs of the customer. He can predict the needs of the customer. So we went, we invested in highly in San Francisco, in Bay Area. We have now up there about 300 people. He hired immediately the most smart people from the Bay Area. And uh, it's the fastest growing business of West Union, the digital business, the, especially the mobile apps. 50% mm -hmm. of the digital goes in mobile apps. Mm -hmm. 
and it's the uh, people we hired are the young people. And you know, don't forget, it was a cultural change also for us, for West Union. We are a traditional company, 165 years old, financial institution, you know, made history in many parts. And we, do, we did wear ties and blue suits like that when we come to the office. And first time we opened the Bay Area, the people were sitting on the floor and, you know, had their high headphones on, really like in the movies. <laughs> <laughs> and I come and, you know, I come and see my third visit to the Bay Area. I said, I want to see how we are improving. Of course, I came with my suit. The first thing I looked at it, closed the door again, put my tie off, then went walking. You know, I, normally I shake hands of the employees. Well, the first one made, gave me a twist, you know, made like that. <laughs> So we had to change the culture also. It's important <laughs> that um, you on the top have to adapt. So we, are, we don't wear any ties anymore yeah. in all company, including Europe, including London. We don't wear ties anymore. Mm -hmm. We are trying to be more you know, cool and sexy. <laughs> and it reflects in, it does reflect in the numbers. Yep. And yeah. that has been a <laughs> Kind of a strategy yeah. also. Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, well, let, let's turn back, back to Elizabeth. So, Elizabeth, as you think about your, your, your strategy and your, your, your entity and, and how you're creating value uh, through in the ways you are so powerfully doing through the deployment of capital, um, you know, kind of what are, the, what are the trends and developments in this space? How is technology changing? Um, you know, how, how do we adapt this, your model over time to, mm -hmm. Uh, con continue to, uh, uh, to to generate that that shared value, uh, where there's more and more entities around the world in the financial sphere, really focusing on the developing world. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, when we when I when I first arrived at OPIC and we just tried to decide what what it was we were going to focus on, I mean, we really thought about our comparative advantage and thinking, what are the what are the world's greatest challenges that require public private sector investment but where a public sector can have a boost to making that capital flow. And we turned immediately to renewable resources broadly writ, because I think we saw that, um, that frankly, the opportunity to transform the global economy is right now is into a low carbon economy, basically, and one that is less resource intensive is probably the greatest economic dr driver of our time. Um, and we also saw that we, and it's one of the greatest challenges and one of the greatest opportunities, basically, for the private sector to play a role. So, you know, think about the opportunity to take a, a global economy, which is re right now resource intensive, inefficient, polluting, dirty, expensive, and in exclusive, meaning serving the only rich, only the rich, to one that is sustainable, green, clean, cheaper, and more inclusive. And to that, us, that was a challenge that we saw private, our, our capital could really be quite catalytic. So we established renewable resources as our, as, our, as our principal priority and also low income countries, but I'll, I can come to that in a second. And you know, and we focus on renewable energy at first because that's the one that's the most commercially financeable. You know that we, we saw our portfolio in renewable energy grow a hundred fold. <laughs> so we're now doing over a billion dollars every year financing renewable energy projects in low income countries, ranging from huge utility scale project in geothermal in Kenya and wind in Senegal and in Kenya and solar in South Africa, all the way down to the microgrid, mini grid, or even uh, solar home systems uh, throughout the continent. So this is a billion dollars a year we've been able to generate in, in that space and, and we're, we're very excited about that. Um, but we've also found um, some traction in other dimensions of renewable resources, whether it be water or, or forestry, a little bit trickier to find those commercial opportunities, but we've we've been proud to be able to uh, to do that. So the other area that we've focused on more that that's sort of more of a sector focus. From a regional perspective, we focus on those countries that are the lowest income countries and those that are the most vulnerable to extremism and conflict. Believe it or not, right now, despite the fact that we're generating income and we write off only one percent of our portfolio every year, despite the fact that we're doing, by definition, deals that no other, no bank would do. 30% of our portfolio are in countries that are vulnerable to conflict or surrounded by extremism. Um, so these are areas where we think we have a real comparative uh, advantage. Um, I can talk about the extremism area in, in a second, but just looking at the lower income countries, take, for example, Africa, where we've made a big effort and are doing about four times under the Obama administration than, than was done in previous administrations 
every year. Um, and that ranges from you know, critical infrastructure in, for example, renewable energy, as I mentioned earlier, throughout the continent, but also programs like, like, um, like education, where we're supporting an organization, for example, Bridge Academies, which many of you may know, who are doing uh, standardized curriculum used off of tablets in schools throughout Kenya, where they're expanding incredibly quickly and are able to offer a super high quality education for $6 per month per student with much better test scores than was the case before. Or a hospital in Rwanda, in Luanda, Angola, that's providing uh, health care to 90,000 uh, Angolans today. So I could go on and on of these, of these stories. But suffice it to say that maybe stepping back, um, renewable resources we think is something where the public and private can do an enormous amount of catalytic work together. And lower income countries and conflict of affected zones are ones where we believe very strongly that with public sector support, the private market can provide the capital that's going to change the way the U.S. interacts in these markets and create uh, investments that are creating the jobs and opportunities and really projecting the best of, of what we want to project in some of these places mm -hmm. and contributing to the stabilization of, of places like the West Bank or, or Jordan or, or Egypt or Iraq. Mm -hmm. Um, where we need desperately, as all of us, as mankind, to create opportunities in those markets, and the private sector is the one that's going to do it. And how can you have really low write-offs in conflict-ridden countries? You know, it's the question I get uh, asked an awful lot, and I think there's a number of reasons. One is, uh, and most important of which is that, frankly, the OPEC teams are, you know, have a, a huge amount of experience operating these markets. We're uh, the, it's, it's, we've got a tremendous underwriting track record and expertise in And translate underwriting for this group. What does that really mean? What, what's underwriting to, all about? We know how to structure deals in the safest possible way that's the most flexible, that's adapted to the cash flows of the underlying project, very long term if need be, uh, to ensure that that project succeeds. And one counterintuitive thing that the bankers in you may be surprised at um, but what strikes me is that our non-performing loans tend to be quite high, but our write-offs are quite low. And so the gap between that, which you don't see with private banks, means that we're doing our job because investors that work in, in, you know, in, uh, in Mali or in Afghanistan where we have a huge portfolio or in Iraq or in South Sudan where we actually are trying to build a hotel, believe it or not, um, you know, these investors are gonna struggle as, as governments change, as, as business and enabling environments are unsteady and in formation. Mm -hmm. And so they're gonna have delays in their payments sometimes. They're gonna struggle. Mm -hmm. But we work with them to make sure that that doesn't, tra that doesn't translate into failure in the end of the day or a write-off. So I would say that flexibility and that patience mm -hmm. is one of the most important reasons why we're able to succeed. Mm -hmm. And I want to just come back to something that Hikmet was mentioning, because to me, um, the biggest challenge to shared value really taking hold and transforming the world as it should do and will do is short-termism. And I see short-termism in a number of different variants. You touched on one of the most important one, which is the impatience of the shareholder and the holding of CEO CEOs and CFOs to quarterly results. And there are so few companies throughout the world that actually explicitly embody in their shareholder, you know, in their shareholder directives to management that the, the creation of long-term shareholder value is what that's, that, 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 that uh, mandate is. I mean, you mentioned one. Nestle earlier. Mm -hmm. Nestle is being one of the great companies that has actually embedded that long-term shareholder value into their, into their shareholder proxies. But that's only one dimension of short-termism that's a problem uh, for me. Another dimension is the markets. You know, the markets don't provide 20-year financing anywhere. And some of the most important infrastructure that needs to be built in these countries, life-giving infrastructure, whether it be power or water or sanitation, takes 20 years for the payback. So that's where an organization like, like OPEC can play a huge role because we're able, because we have a source of funds, the U.S. Treasury and the public, the public markets with U.S. Uh, the U.S. government guaranteed notes, which is our funding source, we issue notes in the capital markets, we're able to tw issue 20-year notes, and so we can make 20-year loans. And that solves a very important market gap uh, in many of the emerging markets where you can't borrow about beyond one or two years. And then the third 
dimension that literally I was just thinking of as we were talking here, of short-termism that's a serious problem, is that poor households have very high discount rates. The poorer you are, the more you're going to care about money today versus money next month, which pulls against savings and other, be and other behaviors that we want to encourage in poor households. So dealing with the short-termism, the very understandable short-termism of extremely poor people is another factor I think that you know, the, the global community needs to address if we're going to take a longer term uh, perspective to solving all these problems. I think, Matt, do you want to comment? What's, what's changing in your world? What, what are the, what, 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 what's the next chapter going to have to be if you're going to continue to prosper? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, first of all, I want to, I, I like to continue to prosper, obviously, because what I'm doing is it's so fun to run a company and see, uh, seeing that every transaction changes people's life. That's something that motivates me uh, day by day and the customer stories, which are the customer stories, motivate me. But I would like to see that <clears throat> within that, you know, coming back to the short term, within that environment, creating a kind of a environment which is a long term circle. I call it as a kind of a 360 view that everyone can participate on that. And one thing, it's nothing wrong to make profit. I mean, you know, it's nothing wrong that we have high prices. I wouldn't have it high, you know, we got criticized many of, I know some of the faces I remember in their room, in this room sitting, that we were criticized that you are charging people to high prices. Um, saying that, you know, why do you on the poor people charge that money 5 to 10 percent on the fee, going, uh, sending money back home? I would not be in 500,000 locations, won't be in 100,000 loca uh, uh, ATMs, won't be in Mali, won't be the last corner of e India, Bihar, if I wouldn't don't make the profits. And the customers are paying for that to deliver the money on the last mile. So an understanding of the chain, and you, what you do is, is a big work here, understanding that you have to make profits to deliver to the last part of chain, I would like to be a part of it. I would like to be a CEO to explain that and a, prag a pragmatic CEO which does it daily. And nothing bad on that. To making, uh, de redefining capitalism in a way that you serve seven billion people. You don't say, serve only 1% of, uh, of the world. And this is something in my mission. This is something that drives me daily. This is something that makes me happy. And <clears throat> it's hard though. It's hard if you are, you know, have shareholders, they can choose to invest in any company. They can choose to invest in a company which is short term focus, they can invest in a company which is long term focus. But you have to keep your shareholders happy by executing quarter by quarter and delivering also to the 7 billion people the goods, then everybody is a part of the world. Because I believe that we build the borders, people build the borders, people build the, uh, you know, the environment, and to overcome that, to be a part, uh, part of that, it's, we have one world, right? And uh, be a part of that will be something that motivates me daily. Okay. Well, we have very little time. Could we just ask you to each make sort of a, a last comment, which is an answer to this question? Let's start with Elizabeth. So all these people in the room are here because they understand or believe or are intrigued by this potential to actually have an organization that truly creates shared value. It truly benefits society while having the organizational th thrive. Elizabeth, what would you tell people about how to do that in what are, wherever they, you know, what, 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 what allows that to happen? What, what's allowed that to happen at OPIC? What advice would you give to everybody in this room? Um, I see that companies and investors and governments are waking up to the opportunity for in shared value. And they're changing their behavior. They're changing it as a result of people in this room, of what their employees are asking for, what their customers are asking for, what young co uh, school leavers are asking for in terms of what they want in their careers. They're asking for purpose-driven uh, lifestyle that more represents their values than the separation between work and values we used to see in, my, in our generation's past. What I, 
I think we all need to bear in mind, though, is that as we come at this, there's too much competition between all of us that mean are trying to drive at the same thing. The socially responsible investing world didn't like the arrival of the upstart impact investors, because who are they to invent this thing? The private sector thinks the public sector has no role in this. The investors think the companies are retrograde and it's only the, pro you know. So I think all of us are working towards the same thing. We've got huge new companies that are coming in now, whether you, that, that are looking at this space, wanting to deploy capital, uh, whether it's you know BlackRock or others in this space, but and we need to find a way for them to deploy it in a way that's inclusive and embracing. Many different strategies, many approaches, many labels, but basically we're all driving at the same thing, which is finding ways for capital and business to share value and to create value while doing so in a financially sustainable manner. And so I think that there's going to be many approaches and strategies, but being more, more embracing and knowing that there's a spectrum of approaches, motivations, incentives, and solutions is the way we need to go. Higby, what advice would you give everybody? You I just keep it very simple and short. Uh, continue to do what you're doing, do the business, but doing in a smarter and better way. And sh that means creating shareholder by involving the people. Don't exclude the people. Involve them in your part of them. That's the way it will work. Great. Well, thank you for this session. Uh, I think just want to uh, just want to repeat a couple of phrases that we heard. Uh, there's nothing wrong with making a profit. <laughs> okay, and I want to. This is one of the greatest barriers we have in this world right now. So many people think that making a profit is a sign of trouble or problem or greed or 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 the evil, you know, of the capitalist system. And I think what we all have to understand, and we have to be courageous enough to talk about openly, is actually it's making a profit that enables almost everything good. And you've heard some wonderful examples here of, of how to think about that. So I, I and then I think the I, I think I think the other thing is that every organization is going to have a different path here. You know, uh, Western Union is going to, you know, d deliver shared value in a different way than Citicorp and J.P. Morgan and, 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 and a mobile telephone-based company. Uh, and OPIC is going to deliver, you know, value in a different way than uh, a traditional development finance organization does or a commercial bank. And we need to learn uh, in the shared value space about how to think more strategically rather than just jump on the same concepts uh, uh, or the same opportunities that, that everybody else is jumping on. So I think hopefully out of this session we can see the fusion of really the essential core of management and business thinking about strategy and, and, and this topic of shared value and also the opportunity. So uh, uh, thanks for our phenomenal panelists who were so clear and so inspiring. And Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Well, and let's thank Michael and the panel. I have to go. We're just.